Hi everyone, my name is Jolie McCrary and this video is part six, the cerebral cortex. This video comes from unit one, biological basis of behavior for AP psychology students. So let's put this video into context by looking at where it falls within the unit. Notice that this particular video falls within the topic about the brain. You should have watched the previous video, part five, which focused on the different structures of the brain. As today's video will go into more depth about the cerebrum and the cerebral cortex, the video to follow will go into more depth about the different research techniques that have been done on the brain that allows us to better understand the way the brain works. After completing today's video, you should be able to answer these three key focus questions. These are the essential concepts that I'll cover through this video. By the end, you will be able to define and describe each of these terms. If you watched the previous video in this series, part five, which focused on the structures of the brain, you may have already accessed one of these sites on your devices. I just recommend that students find a free website or a free app that allows you to look at the structures of the brain in 3D rather than looking at them in that 2D format like you might see on a paper. It just helps you better grasp the size and location and proportion of the parts. Since today's lesson focuses on the cerebral cortex, I'll be using one of these resources as well well. Um, I am going to use the second resource here that's generated from the Society of Neurosciences website called brainfacts.org. So if you watched the previous video in this series, you already know that the cerebrum is the largest part of the brain and it's responsible for our higher order functioning, things like decision making, thinking, action, sensory processing. It's also referred to as the cerebral cortex. And the cerebral cortex is divided into two hemispheres, the right and the left. Our hemispheres are uniquely specialized in their functions, which is the concept of hemispheric specialization, which just refers to the distinct and unique functions that are predominantly managed by each of the hemispheres in the cerebrum. Consequently, hemispheric specialization means that there are certain cognitive processes and behaviors that are housed in or more efficiently controlled by one hemisphere over the other. Another important concept related to the hemispheres is the contralateral hemispheric organization, which just means that it's the phenomenon that one hemisphere controls the other side of the body and vice versa. So that means that the left hemisphere governs the motor and sensory functions of the right side of the body, while the right hemisphere controls those for the left side of the body. This is evident in various neural pathways. For instance, motor signals from the left hemisphere cross over in the brainstem and activate the muscles on the right side of the body and vice versa. Similarly, sensory information from the right side of the body is processed in the left hemisphere. This contralateral control allows for efficient coordination and integration of sensory and motor functions across the body, ensuring a balanced and synchronized movements and perceptions. In stroke patients, contralateral control is evident when damage to one hemisphere of the brain results in impairments on the opposite side of the body. For example, if a stroke occurs in the left hemisphere, it often leads to paralysis or weakness on the right side of the body. So now let's focus on the hemisphere separately. The right hemisphere of the cerebrum is located on the right side of the brain. So my right hemisphere is on my right side, your right hemisphere is on your right side. So the right hemisphere excels in spatial abilities and visualizing objects and navigating through spaces. It's also crucial in recognizing faces and interpreting facial expressions. Additionally, the right hemisphere plays a key role in processing music and other forms of creative expression. The left hemisphere of the cerebrum is located on the left side of the brain, and the left side is primarily responsible for language and communication, such as speech, writing, and comprehension. It is heavily involved in analytical thinking, making it essential for tasks that require detailed analysis, like problem solving, mathematics, and scientific reasoning. The left hemisphere also processes sequential information and is key in understanding and producing structured language, including grammar and syntax. And these specialized functions illustrate the left hemisphere's 
role in facilitating precise, linear, and methodical cognitive processes. It's important for students to know that just because we have hemispheric specialization, that does not mean that you are right-brained or left-brained. This is a common misconception that is taken from the idea of specialization of hemispheres. Now, our brains our hemispheres have very key functions in different types of activities, but that doesn't necessarily mean if you are a creative person or an analytical person that you are right-brained or left-brained. You are whole-brained. You use both lobes of your brain when you are doing creative tasks or analytical tasks. You are using the different functions in those areas of your brain. It's not necessarily linked to a personality trait. So the cerebrum is also divided into lobes, and these lobes almost mirror each other on each hemisphere. The lobes of the cerebral cortex have very specialized functions. First is the frontal lobe, and it's the largest of the four. The frontal lobe is located at the front of the brain. It extends from the forehead back to the start of the parietal lobe. Additionally, the frontal lobe is crucial for higher cognitive functioning. And what that means is things like reasoning, planning, problem solving, decision making, and it also plays a key role in emotions and behaviors, including impulse control and social interactions, as well as movement. The frontal lobe includes highly specialized areas like the prefrontal cortex, the motor cortex, and Broca's area. So within the lobes are more specialized areas. There are three you need to be familiar with within the frontal lobe, and the first is the prefrontal cortex, and it is located at the very front of the frontal lobe, just behind the forehead. This is the part of the frontal lobe that is specifically involved with those higher ordered cognitive functionings. Things like um, planning, making decisions, making judgments, reasoning, problem solving, regulating emotions and controlling impulses. These are those um, functions that are central in our complex thinking. The second more specialized area of the frontal lobe that you need to be familiar with is the motor cortex. The motor cortex is located at the back of the frontal lobe. It stretches across the top of our head, spanning both hemispheres from ear to ear. This section of the frontal lobe controls voluntary movements. The motor cortex is organized somatotopically. This means that different locations on the motor cortex correspond with different parts of our body, creating a motor map that directs mu muscle activity across the body. In 1870, German physicians made an important discovery. They noticed that mild electrical stimulation to different parts of an animal's motor cortex made different parts of the body move. And when they stimulated parts of one hemisphere, it caused movements to specific body parts on the opposite side of the body. The motor cortex sends neural signals to specific muscles coordinating and executing movements with precision. If you watched the previous video, part five, you learned that the cerebellum is also involved with movement. And even though they have similar roles, they're slightly different, but they work together. For example, the motor cortex in the frontal lobe is primarily responsible for initiating and planning voluntary movements by sending direct motor commands to the muscles. And it determines what movements will be made and how they will be executed, whereas the cerebellum is adjusting motor commands and ensuring the precision and balance and smooth execution and coordinating those movements as they're happening. The last highly specialized region of the frontal lobe that you need to be familiar with is Broca's area. Broca's area can only be found in the left hemisphere and it sits just in front of the motor cortex. Broca's area is relatively small in size, but it's crucial for speech production. The primary function of Broca's area is to manage the motor aspects of speech. This includes the production of fluent and coherent speech. Broca's aphasia is a condition resulting from damage to the Broca's area. Individuals with Broca's aphasia typically experience difficulty with speech production, characterized by slow, laborious, and often fragmented speech. While their comprehension of language remains relatively intact, their ability to form sentences and express themselves fluently is significantly impaired, leading to challenges in effective verbal communication. The next lobe of the cerebral cortex that you need to know is the parietal lobe. And the parietal lobe is located near the top and back of 
the brain back behind the frontal lobe. It's moderately large and it plays a key role in processing sensory information from the body. Its primary functions include integrating tactile sensations like touch, temperature and pain, as well as spatial awareness and coordination. The parietal lobe is crucial in processing the information about the body's position in space and enabling spatial orientation and coordination of the movements, contributing to our perception of the sensory stimuli that we take in. Within the parietal lobe is a highly specialized area called the somatosensory cortex. The somatosensory cortex is located towards the front of the parietal lobe and like the motor cortex, it stretches across the top of the head from ear to ear. The primary function of the somatosensory cortex is to receive and interpret sensory information from various body parts, things like touch, pressure, temperature, and pain. Like the motor cortex, it is organized somatotopically, which means that the different areas of the somatosensory cortex correspond to different parts of our body, creating a sort of sensory map that allows for precise localization of the perception of that sensory stimuli. If you stimulate a point on the top of this band of tissue, a person might then may report feeling that touch sensation on a part of their body. The more sensitive a body region, the larger amount of the somatosensory cortex is devoted to it. Your super sensitive lips take up much larger of a surface area on your somatosensory cortex than a very non-sensitive part of your body like your toes. The next part of the cerebrum is the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe sits at the very back of the cerebrum, just above the cerebellum. And the occipital lobe is primarily responsible for processing visual information, like sight, and making sense of the visual stimuli so your brain understands and interprets what is seen. The temporal lobe is located on both sides of the brain, just above the ears, and it extends back to touch the occipital lobe. The temporal lobe is primarily responsible for processing auditory information, making it essential for hearing and understanding speech. It also plays a significant role in memory formation as it houses the hippocampus. Inside of the temporal lobe is a small but very important region necessary for language. This is called Wernicke's area, and Wernicke's area is a highly specialized region in the temporal lobe. It sits near the intersection of the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe, and like Broca's area, Wernicke's area can only be found in the left side of the brain in the left hemisphere. Wernicke's area is primarily responsible for language comprehension. This includes both the ability to understand spoken and written language. Damage to this area can result in Wernicke's aphasia, which is a condition where individuals can produce fluent speech, but it often lacks meaning, and they also have a significant difficulty understanding language. So Wernicke's area is crucial in our ability to comprehend language. This brings us to the end of the content in our video. Let's finish with some review questions. Remember, I'll read the question and you should pause to determine the answer. Question number one says, which lobe of the brain is the arrow pointing to? Question number two says, after being late to work for the fifth time, Esther declared, my occipital lobes must not be working optimally. I have a hard time planning my day to be here on time. If you were Esther's boss, what might you say to her to modify her claim to make it more accurate? And question number three says, surgical stimulation to the somatosensory cortex might result in the false sensation of what? This concludes part six, the cerebral cortex of our unit one series on biological basis of behavior for AP psychology students. 